Awesome. I know we have a couple minutes uh, left, but like, you know, I just thought since you guys are here, I have your attention, maybe we can make it a little bit interactive. So just, I wanted to understand what brought you here. I'm assuming this title spoke to you and that's why you're here because there are multiple tracks in this conference, right? And you chose this one. So I'm assuming there's some kind of problem that you're trying to solve or something that you want to get out of this session. I want to understand what that is. So I would try to make sure I cover that in my session right now. So just shout out whoever can volunteer what they're here for or what would be something that they would want to take away. Yes. Test. Yeah. Okay. As uh, Chad mentioned earlier, it's pretty hard to, to do that first contribution without having shaky hands all the time. And I was hoping to get yeah some better understanding on how to do a proper contribution that will be yeah will actually contribute something instead of just annoy someone. <laughs> <laughs> so it's uh, contributing from the developer perspective. Okay. Okay. Anybody else wants to go? One, two, yes. Um, so everyone I know who were major open source contributors, they all burned out. Mm -hmm. uh, and the vast majority of them, all who worked on pretty important projects, now don't. And so you know, this was kind of a more positive. So best practices, building community, like kind of. So I was just kind of curious to see, you know, like what kind of. Uh, open source communities that are thriving right now, what they're doing, and kind of see if that can apply to, uh, I don't know, ameliorate the things that among the developers I know who really loved open source and then now, you know, like 95% of them don't do it anymore. Uh, okay. Just kind of, you know, like seeing if there's anything to be learned there. Okay. I'm looking for ideas on how to link a local community with a larger global community. Uh, how, to the, the, how to link isolated subgroups together into a larger community of similar interest. How to link smaller groups into a larger community, okay? Anybody else wants to volunteer something? Thank you so much for giving me these pointers. Um, going one, going two, going three. Okay, so thank you so much everyone for your time today. I will try to cover these uh, points. So um, I am a little bit about me. I'm Sujata Tibrewala. I work for ByteDance now, but um, I'm like maybe less than six months in into ByteDance, open source program office. But before this, I was working at Intel. But I'm saying working at Intel, but I was really working in the open source. And my job was to build developer communities and grow those communities. And somebody mentioned linking those developer communities and grow worldwide. I have experience in that. Uh, you see some names over there. Uh, I don't know if any of you have heard of any of those projects. A show of hand if any of you have heard of DPDK, Acreno, One API, etc. I I see one <laughs> one person who's heard of it. So well, the next bullet probably explains. I come from networking software background, and when I started, it was basically building communities open source communities in networking. I worked a lot in, with Linux Foundation networking at that time. So these projects that you see, they were like, you know, uh, very much rooted in networking. That's why they were there. And uh, when I started, so for example, DPDK was one of the flagship projects that Intel started. 
and the keyword Intel started didn't go away. Everybody thought of DPDK as Intel, you know, uh, synonymously. It was my job to de-brand DPDK from Intel. And I'll talk a little bit more about like, you know, how, how I did that, how I like, you know, worked with the communities worldwide, got more contributions into the community, and then rinse and repeat with other communities. And that's why I'm here. Fun facts about me. I am a seven time marathon runner. Maybe I don't look like one. <laughs> Talk about diversity and image. Yes, I do. I am a yogi and I also paint. That is how I de-stress. Somebody was talking about burnt out, burn, burning out. That is one of the ways I avoid burning out. So one thing if it's like, you know, consistent if you're working with worldwide communities is you are ready to sleep and there's somebody else in the world who's ready to wake up, right? So you're always <laughs> like, you know, on the go. But like, you know, there's times when I just take off, take those couple of hours on my weekend to just run or at the end of the night before I sleep, I just take out my notepad and my colors and I start painting. That's how I de-stress. And if you follow me on social media, I share all of that. <laughs> so um, I have a certain roadmap today for the presentation, uh, but please feel free to ask me questions and interrupt me at any point of time. So I know we are at OSPOCon. You all know what open source is. So probably this slide is redundant uh, about defining open source. But I just wanted to show you here that um, just so that we all are level set on the definitions here. Um, Defining open source at the very basic, at the very core is, of course, the code is open source. It's open, it's free to use, like, you know, the cookie recipe that, uh, you know, uh, one of the presenters before shared. Like, you know, you bake the cookie, you put the recipe of the cookie on the cookie box, and you share it with everybody, right? Yes, that's what it is. That's a basic documentation. But that doesn't make a good open source project, right? A good open source project is something that also has community around it. And that's where you have those, the two bigger circles around it. And this is a very loose definition, like, you know, like a stages of open source. So sandbox is something, you know, a developer dream, dreamt of something and just created a project out of the dream and put it out on GitHub, hoping that somebody will pick it up and start contributing. And the other end of the spectrum is a mature open source project like KubeCon, sorry, C, uh, Kubernetes, or like, you know, DPDK, like I was mentioning, or Kata today, or, you know, some of the other things. Where everything is happening in open, there are contributors from different organizations there. Um, there are public meetings held there are, you know, developer days held where there's like, you know, uh, the diverse community decisions are in open. And um, well, now I don't want to use the term merit based because of my previous presenter here, maybe do over, like, you know, doer based community where like, you know, people really raise their hands and do things and they feel empowered and safe to do, do things. And incubation is something in between. You want to be a mature project, but you're not there. You want to be, right? So, um, so there were some questions from developer's perspective. When I was thinking about this talk or I was writing about this talk, this was more from the perspective of somebody like a open source community manager, not from the developer perspective, but I'll try to cover that. So as a project, where are you today? So I'm assuming all of us here are associated with one open source project 
or the other, right? So with this definition, can I have a show of hands of how many are there in the sandbox stage, for example? Okay, a couple. How many are in the incubation stage? Okay, and rest of you are in the mature project range? Can I assume that? Okay, one. Well, this is a mystery. <laughs> a test. Can everybody raise their hands, please? Ah, not everybody is capable of raising hands. Okay, the test failed. Again, how many belong to a sandbox project? Okay, still a couple. How many incubation? A couple. Mature. Okay. <laughs> so, anyway, I'm as so. I'm assuming, or I'm basing this talk on ba that everybody wants to grow up and become a mature project. Is that a good assumption? Yep. Okay. I see. Okay. So then we agree on that. So. If, you, if your destination is to become a mature project, what is your path? The path seems to be very easy. You want to go from sandbox to incubation, what do you need? You know, need more community, right? More than the developer who dreamt of this project. You need openness. What do you mean by openness here in the context of open source? Any volunteers? Yes. Transparency. Transparency. Okay. Any other? So basically, yes. 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 How decisions are made. Uh, yes, you have the code out there, you have the documentation out there, but if you're not sharing some things, you're being selective maybe on the project roadmap and things like that. You don't want to do that. And um, meritocracy or duocracy, however we define it, right? So if a developer's feature is good, you either the community is open to accept it, or if they don't accept it, they are transparent about the decision of why not to accept it. Because the fastest way to lose somebody is to feel like their voice is not heard. And that is why we had this previous talk, right? Like people drop out or people feel burnt out, in my opinion, is when they feel that they're not recognized or not heard. So this is what, like, you know, we want to, and these are the, like, you know, and the, uh, these are easy words to say, but very difficult to implement. So, yeah. So from going from sandbox to incubation, yes, you need more community, openness and meritocracy, and you know, from incubation to maturity. But how do you build community? Um, when I was at Intel, we, my manager had a lot of community developers under him, and he used to always say something, one thing, that it, he always was amazed on how different each community manager was, and how they handled their community. And probably you saw that in the speakers before me, how they talked. The way I approach that problem to build community or to get those first contributions in is to build a funnel. Is anybody here from marketing? Okay, there are a couple of people, right? So funnel is a very typical term used in marketing, yes. So, and this is how like, you know, brands work, they just, pump out the ads in hope, like, you know, they bombard the ads on everything, all possible channels, hoping some conversions, like maybe 1% or 0.1%, and then, like, you know, finally they become their uh, buyers. So this is pretty much, uh, this is pretty much how I approached. Uh, go out in the community, talk about your pro project, make them aware of it, you know, like how we are talking at, is this, at this conference. And then when you are talking to a developer, you're actually making a negotiation for their time. 
Why I'm saying negotiation, you're asking them of the most precious entity they have, which is their time. Yes, you are giving them the information for free, but they're giving you a precious commodity time, right? So their time commitment increases from the acquisition phase here to the engagement phase. So at the broad end, you are just talking, developer is just passively listening to you. And then you conduct hands-on workshops, hackathons, you have them onto asynchronous communication channel. So this third part is important to build a inclusive community. Inclusive community where worldwide was one question, right? If you are not in the same time zone, the developer cannot attend your meeting. If that is the only way you're communicating, you're excluding them, right? So do hands-on workshops, hackathons. It, it asks more time of the developers. Once they get inspired, so some of the developers who you talk to at meetups conferences, they get inspired. They are more curious to learn. They come to hands-on workshop. Make it easy for them to play with your code. Once they get their hands dirty, they get more inspired. They build something with it, proof of concept. Now you are increasingly asking for more and more of their time. Right? At each stage, build recognition uh, programs so that like you know if the developers are coming they are being recognized for that if they are doing a poc you're being they are being recognized for that like you know uh, the person from red hat was talking about like you know point system something like that and then once they're at the broad end of the funnel they actually become contributors give them the title of external advocates they are experts they are your ambassadors into the community. Any questions at this point? Yes. How do you deal with conflict? Right? So you, you talked a lot about inclusion, which is very important. But the thing that I've seen hurt a lot of communities is when conflict, especially yes. driven by like American <laughs> political issues, for example, yeah, so actually I have a slide on that. Wait. Uh, if you want to wait to get to it when yes, you get your slides. Yes, no, that's fine. fine. Um, so conflict, in the event of conflict, first you have to understand, first you have to listen what the conflict is about, okay? And then most of the times conflicts are like, you know, maybe there is some kind of, when their people are passionate, when people are passionate, there is like some kind of ego involved, right? So uh, I am right, he's wrong, or she's wrong, or she's right, I'm wrong. So make that argument not about person, make it impersonal. So I, how, how am I doing on time? Really fell through a hole in the boy's pocket. Someone picked. Oh, the voice is working. Get up off the street, went to the boy's house. And so stand. this is a clip from Twelve Angry Men. Have you heard of this movie? I did a leadership course at Stanford, and this is a textbook case of how to resolve conflict. So this clip. Oh, okay. I think yeah, we'll have to work. So basically. What the 12 angry men is, like it starts with everybody in the jury saying that this person is guilty. And then there's just one person who says, we need to hear, we need to argue uh, because we are sending this person to the chair. He's not saying I'm right, you guys are wrong. He's saying we are sending one person to the chair. So we owe it to the person who we are sending to the chair that we at least give him a fair chance. So he makes the argument about an, a goal which is larger than you and me, which everybody can get behind. Does that make sense? Yeah, largely. I mean, do you, do you think it's ever just kind of inevitable that you just have to cut people out of the community proactively to kind of save the community? 
Sorry, uh, say that one more time. Do you think it's ever necessary to proactively just kind of remove pe people from the community to avoid? Yeah, if they're being very disruptive, if they do not, like, you are trying to bring objectivity into the argument, if they are not doing that, then of course, you may have to remove them. Fair enough. <laughs> but give them a fair chance before, right? see my slides, but are you guys able to see? My slides disappeared from the screen. So there was a question about uh, the first contribution is very hard, right? Getting that first contribution is hard from the developer's perspective and also from the perspective of the project, getting that first contribution into the project is hard. Do we agree on that? Yes. So actually, so this is a hard problem, not just for an open source project. This is also a hard problem for a minority opinion. There are 10 people in a meeting, you have an opinion and the other nine have the other opinion. Again, I'll go back to the 12 angry man exam men example. When you are the minority opinion, it is very easy to sideline you and trivialize you. But the moment you are able to win another person to your side, then you are two people, you are not minority anymore. In my culture, there is a saying, one plus one is equal to 11. In Hindi, it says, ek aur ek gyara. Has anybody heard of that? Yeah. So basically, you just won your first stakeholder. You are not that odd person, you are not that oddity. So it is similar in open source project. So before even you start talking about your open source project, ask yourself, why? Why does this open source project matter? What problem does it solve? Once you can answer that question, it will be easy for you to talk to others in the community. And once it is solving a real world problem, it will be easy for others to get behind. So like I was mentioning the other example, right? The why this person is arguing in the 12 angry man is we are send, sending one person to the chair and we want to give this person a fair chance before we make him die, right? It's easy for everybody to get behind that. So if you have a clear why for your open source project, it's easy to talk to others. So here I'm showing some stakeholders or example stakeholders that you can get into the community. And coming back to the burnout questions or why people don't work in open source, you know, people are usually more motivated or feel less burnt out if they know why they are doing things. If they don't understand why they are doing things, then it's easier for them to burn out. Does that make sense? Like frequently people do startups and they work 24 by 7, but you ask them, are you burnt out? Probably, but they're happy, they don't feel burnt out because they know why they're working. So I, maybe I'm trivializing the problem, but like that is one of the ways that you can do. So, you know, give them the why, give them the recognition, hear them out. That is one of the ways that you can avoid burnout. So, what, so community is one thing, 
but openness is meritocracy, right? So, this is like nothing new. I think we all know the basics, right? You have to have a basic documentation, you have to have the website, somebody was talking about mailing list, so things are out in the open, things are discussed out in the open. If you want to invite others, you have a clear contribution guideline, so people know what actually, uh, you know, how they can get contribut contributions into the community and if they are rejected, why they, they would be rejected. And like, you know, what are the bugs and, you know, what are the enhancements? Be open, you know, have a clear code of conduct. So like you were mentioned, if somebody is being disruptive, that's bad code of conduct. And respect others, you know, uh, open source um, projects and like, you know, trademark logos, etc. Okay, now you, with hopefully with all these practices, you got your first uh, contributors and now you want to increase your contributions and go to mature. How do you do that? There is only one formula I can give you. Whoever were your first contributors, if you have one, you have two, you have four, recognize them. Make, give them the floor. Give them the limelight. Peaks more than, you know, somebody else talking about your project. So I talked about DPDK, right? So when I built DPDK Summit, in the DPDK Summit, I had 90% non-Intel content. That was my formula to get, you know, community in. In the beginning, in the first year, it was very difficult because we didn't have as many contributors. I worked whole year tirelessly with them. I gave them the gift of my time, like, you know, working with them, understanding what their problems was, were how I could enable them. Some needed hardware, some needed engineering support, some needed like, you know, maybe stipend, some only needed my guidance on how to talk to their, uh, you know, boss or like, you know, their guide in the university on letting them contribute. So, you know, I did all that. And first year, I didn't need a lot because, you know, I only had a one day summit and I just needed eight or 10 speakers. So one year, 40 developers, I talked to 40 developers, got eight of them. Like, you know, they finished a POC to a level that we were confident, the review committee was confident that they, when they come on stage and talk, there'll be enough meat behind their talk. And that is what will inspire the next set of developers. And why is that? Social currency, right? Anybody heard of salting tip jar? This is another uh, term in marketing being used. You know, you go to a coffee shop, there is a tip jar. There's always some money left in that tip jar. If you put coins there, people are going to throw coins. If you put bills, people are going to throw bills. So you want your tip jar to be salted. You want to showcase your contributors. And you want to give them a good experience so that they will go and inspire other developers. So then, like, you know, going from incubation to maturity, you have to up your level of openness and the way you, you know, reward meritocracy. Now you have real POCs, hopefully. So find different ways of sharing it. Video, like, you know, people learn in different modalities, sight, sound, words. So have blogs, have videos, have podcasts, have conferences, have hands-on training. Showcase your contributors. And then, like, you know, have them commit and merge in like, you know, in the community, have your decisions out there in the open, make them part of your technical oversight committee or like, you know, technical steering committee, whatever you want to call them. Make all those decisions out there in the open, have a meeting time, which is public. Anybody can join the meeting. Maybe decisions are made by the technical steering committee. 
but the meeting is free to join. Anybody can voice their opinions and always, always have an asynchronous communication channel. Maybe somebody is in a different time zone. Maybe somebody is doing it off their free time. They have like, you know, four hours of domestic duties to do after their work and they still want to do open source. They can't join another meeting, but they can join an asynchronous channel. So be, be inclusive. And hopefully that will lead you to being a mature open source project. Now I will talk about some roadblocks to all this happening. I mean, it all seems very romantic that, you know, everybody believes in open source and you'll build the community in no time. But there is always non-believers and detractors and sometimes, you know, business comes in the way. How do you win them over so that you can follow that path? How many of you have actually in, uh, encountered open source detractors or people who don't believe in open source? There are a few, right? So, uh, I'll again come back to it that people who don't believe in open source, they usually have a reason. Do you agree? Do they give you a reason? I have put some reasons like, you know, they are afraid probably to give up control. They say, this is a project that we own, we have developed, we have invested in. Why should we open source it? and give an edge to our competitor, right? Or they say, you know, this project, we totally control it. We know what to do, what are the processes? How do we, like, you know, if we make it open source, maybe the quality will reduce. So here are some arguments. These days, nobody wants to be logged in. I think I'm, am I, how am I doing on time? Oh, okay, <laughs> great. So, um, so I'll give you a story uh, for giving up control and staying competitive. I'll again go back to the DPDK project because that was one of the earliest projects that I worked on. So uh, there was a particular customer that our marketing team was trying to convert DPDK onto, like, you know, they were trying to sell DPDK to this particular customer. And this customer was actually our competitor, uh, uh, was buying from our competitor, not from us. Right? So uh, what our marketing team did was they invited them to one of the DPDK conferences. And like I earlier told you, I had 90% non-Intel content over there in that conference. So when uh, speakers are talking, audience are asking questions, guess who's replying to those questions? Not people from Intel, not developers wearing Intel badges. Developers from our competitors, developers who were partners, like, you know, but not people from Intel. This happened till lunchtime, and in lunchtime, I heard this marketing person's VP tell one of his engineers, I think DPDK is really an open source project now. There's no reason for us now not to move to DPDK. And yeah, rest is history. They did move to DPDK. And so we won that business just because we followed open source practices. And uh, why did we use open source or why were we doing open source? Um, same reason why like, you know, what uh, the speaker from Red Hat mentioned sometime earlier, right? It saves company costs. We get free testers, you know, I can't like, you know, every time I, to uh, I heard from somebody that, oh, this is not supported in this open source project. And I would just go and say, hey, 
this is an open source project if it's not supported please develop that feature and contribute contribute back to it it's an open source community and many times it worked they did you know develop that feature and contribute it back to the community right so you get so many different users use your software in ways you don't even you wouldn't even dream of existed i'll give you another example i mentioned another project one api the reason we went into one api was because we were trying to get into the gpu market but our gpu was not ready yet so yes we are putting this open source project into the hands of developers but gpu is not ready yet so developers can't test it on gpu but it was all, it also used to work on fpgas fpgas were ready in the market and it gave developers a huge advantage that like you know anybody has programmed over fpga before no okay programming on fpga is a completely different uh, stack like you know you need to know the tools you need to know different operating system different language blah 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 it's a huge learning curve but with one api developers could program with just c so that was a huge advantage when we put out that project we never thought we will get traction so much traction on one api with fpg but that's what happened but so my point is we don't understand how, when we or when an open source project is put out there the community uses it in so many different ways that the original developers would have never have imagined and that actually makes that software better and because and when you are proactive and you work on that feedback it actually is going to make your software better so it is going to improve your quality and it's going to improve your reputation how many of you think of google as a reputable company okay maybe <laughs> but i mean a lot of people want to work for that company right because everybody knows that they work in open source and they contribute to open source so you know you'll attract best talent and 99% of the talent is outside your company so i'll come back to my earlier point on how to win conflict so when you talk to open source detractors listen to them really listen to them what are their concerns and then come back with you know good counter arguments well there will, there may be times when it doesn't make sense and that's okay you know some things will never be open sourced and that would be okay so you know just listen so anyway these are some examples we heard from lenus in the morning and then chat gpt is another example of this paper if you have not read this paper if you are interested in generative ai please go and read it attention is all you need just because it was out there in the open community took it up and like you know now we know where we are so anyway this is my round up of building community from scratch listen to the community learn by contributing there's more ways to contribute than just code treat your community as a team be inclusive and share spotlights thank you and sorry i forgot about this if you want to work with us i do work with for by dance right so we are having a innovator program and if you want to join us would love to work with you we have 50 plus open source projects and if you are interested to learn about those projects you can take my contacts i can now would love to connect with you and uh, uh, you know this is a qr code is the discord server again my link and my linkedin and my colleagues linkedin are there okay thank you and uh, i don't know if we have a time for a question can you just put it up there 
Any questions? Okay, thank you.